and welcome participants to session four of the Sea of Solutions Partnership Week for Marine Plastic Pollution Prevention 2020. Session four will be dealing with uh, localizing action, reducing plastic leakage in cities and municipal waterways. So as Irene mentioned, I will be your session moderator for this session. And I'll just be briefly introducing to you the rationale behind this session and how you could actively participate uh, and uh, type and, uh, and interact with our speakers. So we all know that big cities and settlements near waterways are major sources of marine litter. And they are also important players in preventing leakage into the marine environment. While framework policies are often made at the national level, implementation of waste management largely falls in the mandate of cities and municipalities. Mayors in Southeast Asia, Southeast and East Asia, and for the rest of the world, uh, for that matter, can lead change on the ground by championing effective and inclusive waste collection, sorting, and disposal, and creating awareness and momentum among city dwellers. This session, session number four, shares good practices, common challenges, and replicable solutions to reduce plastic pollution at the city level. We only have one hour for this session, but we, have, we are jam-packed with tons of um, good practices that will be shared by our uh, distinguished uh, speakers. So uh, we will be having an introduction to Marine Plastic Litter, SDG 11, and the well-being of cities and settlements as a keynote uh, presentation. We, that will be followed by five case studies. Case number one is about plastic waste characterization and hotspots mapping the experience of Danang in Vietnam. We also have case number two, the impacts of plastic waste reduction. Uh, by implementing the program on Hapsay Sapa Creek or settlements transformation in Cagayan de Oro, Philippines. Um, we also have a case study in Banjarmin, Indonesia, about engaging the community, private, and informal sectors in plastic recycling. We also have something about building partnerships, whole community waste reduction actions, the case study of Sham in China. And we also have to know the problem first before identifying specific measures, and that's the application of Wastewise Cities Plastic Leakage Assessment Tool, specifically in Nairobi, Kenya. Now, how could the, all of us participate and interact with each other during the session? The format would be uh, keep, as I said, a keynote presentation plus five case studies. It will be only a five minute lightning talks each presentation, but that will be followed by uh, open forums. Then we'll be giving 10 minute open forums after uh, each batch of three speakers. So we will be entertaining questions after three presenters have presented and another batch after that. Um, you may wish to put type in your questions in the chat box of uh, this Zoom platform. And ideally, if you can also identify to whom the question is addressed, that would be great. So without further ado, we will be moving on to the first presentation. Um, our first speaker would be, is, is the Human Settlements Officer at UN Habitats Regional Office for Asia and the Pacific based in Fukuoka, Japan. On an interim basis, he also oversees UN Habitats Global Program on Climate Action and Urban Environment. He holds master's degrees in economics and environmental policy to speak on the topic marine plastic litter, SDG 11, and the well-being of cities and settlements. Please welcome Mr. Bernhard Barr. Bernhard. Thank you very much, uh, Voltaire. And uh, next slide and next slide, please. Um, great pleasure to be here uh, today and um, to give this uh, very brief uh, introduction, you have presented it as a keynote, which is uh, maybe for a five minutes a lightning talk a little bit much. Next slide, please. Um, so UN Habitat is the custodian agency uh, uh, for the SDG target 11.6, uh, which deals with um, the environmental impact on cities, including solid waste, and in particular, uh, indicator 11.61, uh, which is about uh, waste collection and, and adequate uh, discharge of waste uh, generated by cities. What does that mean? Um, UN Habitat, of course, is globally uh, responsible for uh, the, the data collection on this. Um, is responsible for the uh, 
the, the methodology for the measurement, but it's also, and I think this is important for this uh, meeting, supporting the uh, methodology for the city level um, collection of, uh, of data in a, in a way that it is comparable globally. Next slide. So, um, of course, this meeting uh, overall looks at marine plastic litter. Today, we're looking very much at urban solutions. So I'm just highlighting very briefly um, what we are talking about and the key interest of you and Habitat. Um, of course, we are looking at uh, limited waste collection in, in many parts of uh, the urban world. Next slide. Um, we are also, of course, looking at um, how this uh, waste uh, ends up uh, in the sea, to some extent, of course, uh, washed in along rivers and, and creeks, uh, but also, of course, uh, through coastal uh, communities. Next slide. We are um, also looking at um, dump sites that are uncontrolled and therefore uh, leak into the environment. Uh, we look at uh, illegal dumping, um, and that also includes uh, sometimes by waste collectors uh, that uh, um, do dump uh, outside of the designated sites. Uh, we're looking at uh, urban operations that uh, cause uh, dumping into the sea, um, and of course, from our perspective, the impact on communities is uh, equally critical to ensure that uh, waste uh, dumping can be prevented. Next slide. Um, next slide. So for UN Habitat, a key uh, um, initiative is the Healthy Oceans Clean Cities Initiative, uh, UN Habitat's first uh, program that looks specifically at marine plastic litter. UN Habitat, of course, engages globally in um, many solid waste management uh, project that might have um, a marine plastic litter dimension to this, but this project has marine plastic litter as an entry point. And um, just to very briefly say, we're looking at this from a national level, um, looking at national policy, but uh, very much then at the localization, working with local governments and communities. Um, to, to implement those policies, but also supporting directly the local governments and the communities in the development of comprehensive action plans. Um, and uh, then of course, also the community engagement for the advocacy and outreach campaigns. Next slide. And so uh, that's it. Thank you very much, Voltaire, back to you. Uh, thank you very much for that uh, presentation, Bernard. Uh, so moving on to the next uh, presentation, our act actually our first case study. Um, our next speaker is uh, uh, an urbanist serving at, as economic affairs officer in the sustainable urban development section of UNESCAP, where he coordinates the organization's effort in localizing the SDGs, Paris Agreement, and new urban agenda. He has over 16 years experience in formulating sustainable urban development strategies. And his current portfolio includes designing and implementing municipal solid waste management, affordable housing, urban climate action, municipal finance, and urban management technical assistance programs in over 24 countries across Asia and the Pacific. So to present case study number one, closing the loop, plastic waste characterization and hotspots mapping, the case study in Danang, Vietnam, please welcome Mr. Omar Siddiq. Omar. Thank you, Voltaire, um, and thank you for, for working on the slide. So, um, uh, Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, it's really a privilege to be able to present um, in a lightning format uh, one of our solutions from UNSCAP, um, working with many different partners um, in the region to in addressing this urgent crisis that we have um, in Southeast Asia and Asia Pacific in general um, on marine plastic litter. Uh, this is an initiative called Closing the Loop, um, which is supported by, by funds from the government of Japan as part of the rollout of the Osaka Blue Ocean Vision. And really what success looks like for us is for cities in ASEAN to use innovative data, 
partnerships in smart technology to monitor and assess ocean bound plastic waste from municipal waterways of all sizes. And then with that information, really develop planning and policy and investment strategies to stop marine plastic pollution at the source, applying circular economy principles in their solid waste management systems. Uh, I mentioned the Osaka Blue Ocean vision. Um, so uh, this project is in alignment with the 2050 net zero target from that. But we have a focus specifically on um, Southeast Asia. So, and we are part of uh, the implementation of the ASEAN Framework of Action on Marine Debris and the National Marine Litter Action Plans. And of course, um, UN Habitat mentioned 11.6, but we are also uh, cognizant of the interlinkages between um, 12.5, that is STDs on responsible consumption and production, and 14.1 on marine litter. Um, one of our findings actually for the need for this initiative is that while there are many national marine litter action plans in place or shortly to be in place, many of the local authorities did not have uh, similar types of plans that were aligned. So we're wondering about um, the institutional capacity for a whole of government approach in actually implementing these national marine litter action plans. We're working with four cities. Um, in, in, in Southeast Asia that have quite a diversity in terms of hydrology as well as uh, geography in general. Uh, Makon Si Tamarat in Southern Thailand, which is quite interesting because it's on an extensive canal network. Uh, Kuala Lumpur on the Klang River needs no uh, further introduction, capital of, of Malaysia. Um, da Nang, Vietnam, which is a large coastal city, which I'll do a little bit of a deep dive on some of our uh, data work that we've done there, and Surabaya, Indonesia, which is the second biggest city in East Java province of Indonesia. Next slide. Um, so one of the key things that we found is that cities uh, need uh, data and information in order to have evidence-based planning in five different areas. So first is around the waste generation. So how much generation tons per year as well as per capita is being generated. Second is the plastic composition. Uh, so we need to know what types of items are being generated and how much and how much of that is actually entering into the environment. And what we found actually is that while having data on the polymer or resin type of plastic um, is important, when it comes to marine litter, the item type characterization is actually quite influential in terms of what um, ends up as ocean bound plastic, either directly dumping through the water through the land or very importantly from a city context looking at the drainage system and seeing how much plastic waste and waste in general is being uncollected and sitting in the in the drainage system which often during a uh, rainy season in many of these cities gets flushed directly into um, uh, oceans and waterways um, we've partnered with the international solid waste association the marine litter task force for an international um, methodology called the plastic pollution calculator which provides the scientific evidence base um, through the detailed plastic waste generation of flows through the waste management system and also looks at locations and conditions. And I mentioned some of the meteorological conditions, but also temporal conditions where plastic escapes into the environment and becomes unmanaged. And I think that's really the area specific aspect of this tool is really important because um, having an idea of the data um, of plastic waste generation and composition through different land use types in the city is really critical to having more precise socio-technological as well as infrastructure investments and policy actions. So simply what we're seeing is that the type of plastic that's being generated and the amounts are, are quite different, uh, whether it's a commercial area or residential area or so on and so forth. Next slide. Um, some of the early results in, 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 Viet, in Da Nang, Vietnam, and this is a preview uh, from a report that we will be um, launching at the beginning of next year. Um, but essentially what we could see is that and you'll see a Sankey diagram to your right, which essentially is a material flow analysis of the plastic waste that's generated. Um, and 92% um, is retained at landfill, 3% is actually recycled. However, um, there is no formal recycling system in Da Nang, so this 3% is done mainly through the informal waste economy. 0.02% um, is openly burnt, um, which is not marine litter, but contributes to the widening uh, problem of air pollution in the cities. And 1% of the plastic that is generated in the city becomes a marine litter. So you might think 1%, that's not that much, right? But actually, this equates to 639 tons of plastic that Da Nang City is emitting into uh, the ocean every year and millions more different item types. And what do those item types really look at? Well, 77% of what we're seeing emitted into um, the environment, both terrestrial and marine, 
in Da Nang is plastic bags. So these are really problematic, uh, low density, uh, low quality items that are often not um, picked, for example, by the informal uh, waste pickers as something like PET would be. Um, we're seeing that also most of it is um, from office and other commercial locations, and then secondly by uh, residential. We were quite surprised that the retail sector is only about 4% of the plastic waste that is being generated. And finally, what we're seeing is that um, in terms of the spatial distribution across the seven districts um, in Da Nang, there's a huge correlation um, with um, districts that receive large numbers of tourists each year in terms of uh, the profile of their of their waste generation. Um, a note that we have then uh, we have uh, produced these figures um, also with uh, the Institute for Global Environment Strategies. Glad to see them on the call, as well as IUC and Vietnam. Um, to note that we did use baseline figures for plastic, not the COVID year. We are having a separate primary study on the effects of COVID in each of the cities. Um, but this is for an average year um, that is not uh, the anomaly with uh, related to COVID. Next. One aspect as well that we want to complement, what we're hearing a lot from local authorities in the region is the need to transition to more uh, digital infrastructure systems as a result of COVID-19 recovery. This is a huge priority. So we are partnering with Japan, Japan Space Systems to create an innovative remote sensing tool, which will use a combination of satellites, either Sentinel-2 or, um, or others, a WeWorld, drone, citizen science, and fixed camera, uh, to be able to monitor ocean-bound plastic in real time. Um, and, be, and we will be using this open source tool to train the city governments to really monitor these hotspots. Um, so hopefully it becomes more accurate, more real time, and also cheaper for the local authority. And finally, what do we do with all this wonderful information from both the primary surveys um, as well as the remote sensing technology? We are um, in the process of designing a six-step city marine pollution action planning process, which includes applying the scientific data through a multi-stakeholder process virtual capacity building from e-learning courses. And what we also want to do is um, crowd in private sector investment for these marine plastic plans. Um, so we really see that financing part of the planning process is that missing link between those plans being implemented or not. So I'll stop there. Um, there's more information on the project at the URL at the bottom of your screen, and I'll yield the floor over to uh, Voltaire. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Omar, for that uh, good presentation about uh, uh, the interaction between having a good baselining and hotspotting uh, of plastics in riverine environments and also linking it up with decision-making process. We're looking forward to having uh, to hearing from you next year, probably, for uh, much bigger um, results and impact uh, discussions. This is very promising. Thank you very much, Omar. Now we move on to the third uh, presentation, the first, uh, the third of the first batch of presentations. Um, our next speaker uh, has more than 34 years combined experience in a multifaceted career that has connected the arts, public service, in capacities as elected official, government employee, and consultant, and education. He earned an MA in government management from the University of the City of Manila and an BA in sociology and anthropology from Xavier University, Ateneo de Cagayan. He believes that synergy in general and among agencies is necessary to get things done and to effectively enable communities and minorities. So to speak on Hapsay Sapa Creek, settlements, transformation, impacts on plastic waste leakage reduction in Cagayan de Oro City, Philippines, let's welcome Mr. Patrick Uiguanco Gabotina. Patrick, please. Mayong hapon. Good afternoon. Imagine having to walk a very narrow, unlit path to your home with a wall with no hole handholds on one side and the black waters of a garbage clogged creek on the other. Imagine those conditions complicated by a fire in the interior portion. How will the fire truck get close enough to put it out? Imagine those conditions complicated further by a flood. How can people safely evacuate? That's how the people along the creek side of Barangay 22 lived, with the certainty that they might not be saved, nor be able to save themselves. With the Hapsay Sapa Waterways Rehabilitation Project, we help people realize that they are not that helpless. It took time, but they came around to the idea that they can help themselves. 
The UN Habitat provided funding and technical assistance. The private sector lent their equipment to help declog the creek. The academe deployed its student leaders to organize dialogues with the residents. In the end, no demolitions took place since people voluntarily dismantled homes, encroaching on the easement and voluntarily opted for resettlement. Creekside residents take part in regular cleanup. Creek water quality was, has improved from class D to class C, and people now have a park to enjoy and space to grow communal gardens and for maintenance and life-saving equipment to enter. Next slide, please. The passage of the Integrated Ecological Solid Waste Management Code of Cagayan de Oro was a milestone for the Cagayan de Oro City Local Environment and Natural Resources Office. Glen was finally, it was finally able to successfully close the 17 hectare old open dump site in Barangay Carmen and open a new 45 hectare sanitary landfill in Barangay Pagalungan. According to the Department of Environment and Natural Resources, the new sanitary landfill is the best and most well operated landfill by an LGU. Sadly, the new landfill will not last forever if the city continues to generate a daily, daily garbage volume of 360 tons per day. With the aim of hitting their 90% waste diversion target by 2024, Clenro lobbied for the city council to enshrine mandatory waste segregation and a ban on the use of plastic bags by commercial establishments in the 2018 ordinance. In January 2019, the plastics bags ban was enforced, and in July that same year, 46 of the city's barangays piloted the no segregation, no collection policy. As a result, there has been a marked decrease in plastic bags among the city's residual waste. Next slide, please. When the open dump site in Barangay Carmen was closed, 300 waste pickers were displaced and lost a livelihood that many of them had been relying on for 30 years. So the city organized them into a cooperative and provided seed money for the operation of a materials recovery facility and a co-op store. Nestle Philippines, which operates its only coffee manufacturing plant in Cagayan de Oro, pitched along with Green Ants Builders, a company that specializes in providing eco-friendly building and housing materials. An echo brick making machine was turned over to the co-op, which incorporates shredded plastic laminates into the brick mixture. The machine can produce up to 450 bricks per day. The bricks outperform standard hollow blocks in a stress test. Soon the first building to be built out of these bricks will rise in Cagayan de Oro, and it will house young leukemia patients, the three-story Balay Lunas. These initiatives show us that we are not powerless against the plastic invasion. Hand in hand in a, con in a concerted effort, governments, private companies, schools, the business community, civic organizations, and individuals can successfully address and mitigate the situation. Dekan salamat o mayong hapon. Thank you. Daghang salamat kaayo, uh, Sir Patrick Gabotina of Cagayan de Oro City, Philippines. Uh, we learned a lot from you about uh, having parallel efforts on waste management and your uh, urban transformation initiative to the linear park uh, project. Okay, so at this point, we would like to invite uh, the first three speakers to uh, for, for the open forum uh, Q&A panel discussion to address the questions of participants. Okay, so for the first question, I think uh, we have from the audience, um, who shared that they have uh, re started research project uh, to gather data on sea and river pollution. Um, and it's a, it's a very important uh, part of baselining and policy uh, decision making. Uh, okay. Thank you, Marco. And uh, there was a question about, uh, well, in Bangladesh, people living in coastal regions, and I'm, I'm sure it's not just Bangladesh, but uh, it, it applies to the rest of the world that are not fully aware about protection of their areas, including beaches from plastic materials. Uh, do our speakers have any idea on how to make 
how to make uh, their effective engagement to save seas and beaches. Hi, Voltaire. Um, this is Omar. I can give that a shot to break the ice a bit. Um, so one of the things that we are um, doing is that, you know, uh, for a lot of these uh, frameworks and tools for the local government to assess the uh, amount of plastic waste that's being generated and how it's being emitted into the environment requires a lot of ground data collection, right? Um, so one of the things that we are doing under Closing the Loop is partnering with local universities as well as local um, organizations of the urban poor, for example, through the Asian Coalition for Housing Rights, um, to um, train them as enumerators for some of these surveys as well as beach cleanups. Um, and what that does is that, uh, you know, the process of the data collection for the city also becomes an awareness raising and capacity building exercise um, for the local communities as well. Um, so that's one type of solution um, that uh, we are trialing in, in many of the Southeast Asian countries. Thank you. Over. That is a good advice, Omar. It's uh, about uh, asking the communities and the stakeholders to do it themselves so that they can appreciate also the solutions that to community problems more. Uh, I'm also thinking about, uh, Patrick might also wish to uh, share his experiences. Yeah. I think again, there were. Yes. Uh, yeah, thank you, Voltaire. Uh, we partnered with, uh, with several uh, universities. We partnered with uh, Xavier University and we partnered with uh, USTP, uh, that's uh, University of Science and Technology in the Philippines. And uh, Bitana Creek is uh, one of the, Major creeks in Maria and the Oro, and uh, it's right under in, in their backyard. No, so they were very involved. The faculty and the students were very involved in the information and education campaign, especially in the informal circulars, uh, along, families along the creeks, and then they um, helped in the you know, in the information dissemination in the communities, and also they're you know, they're coming up with uh, innovative ways of. Uh, uh, trapping this, uh, not, uh, getting rid of these plastics, and also um, we're partnering also with the Department of Science and Technology in coming up with uh, plastic densifiers that would you know, uh, effectively uh, transform the plastics that are generated into upcycled materials. So uh, thank you for that. Uh, that's another uh, strategy to work with the local academe and the uh, education sector to uh, leverage all the efforts of the city government. Um, okay. I'm sorry. Uh, well, for, for any one of you, uh, I'd just like to ask if, what do you think is the most important consideration, especially that I think in this particular session, there's lots of city governments who are watching right now. Any other very important, uh, just one single most important factor that they have to bear in mind when it comes to uh, plastic waste management, plastic based lining, or even decision making at the city level. I know, I know. I have a comment. I think it's very important that uh, the, uh, the that's the smallest and you know, smallest uh, government unit in the Philippines, and uh, I think that the the community should be able to own up to the project, and that the community should you know, participate in. In re really reducing the plastic you know, that goes into the oceans, because uh, without the community support, the, what uh, it would, you know, there really won't be a substantial, uh, uh, substantial uh, effect on the reduction of plastic. The, we, there really should be you know, community support and community information and uh, community engagement in all of these things. Okay, so uh, we have a question actually, Patrick, that's directly addressed to you. Um, thank you for your presentation. How much is the collection rate after the policy of no segregation of collection is imposed comparing to before and how much is the collection fees from each household? The collection fees vary. You know? uh, um, we only collect uh, garbage fees for establishments, commercial establishments, and that for, the, for the households, there are, no, you know, there are no garbage fees. And then as for the amount that the reduction that the reduction we were still about to make a study hopefully within the next few weeks and months. but uh looking at it now looking at it uh there was a significant reduction because there are no more plastic bags 
but we're still in the way we're still looking at of how to reduce the plastic bottles. But um, just looking at it, there are no plastics, but we were still not able to measure it with a scientific uh, uh, analysis. Okay, thank you for that. We have actually two questions related to baselining and data collection. Um, uh, one is, uh, what are the views about the use of citizen science projects in the collection of data? And uh, where else? Uh, um, someone who's based in Phuket, uh, plastic pollution comes from diverse sources and from many locations along the Andaman Sea. How can we bring these other parties together to affect change from, from far from their homes? I guess there's also a transnational um, aspect of uh, marine pollution. Anybody would like to answer that? I will tear um, just quickly from my side. So I think citizen science is certainly something that needs to be encouraged. And it's something that we work on a lot um, with the Closing the Loop project. I think one of the challenges has been is that, um, you know, having common definitions and methodologies for that data collection so that you can compare uh, within an intra-urban context. So within different districts of the city is really important when, when coordinating some of those uh, citizen science projects. But that it's something that really gives us that ground truthing uh, to a lot of the secondary data that we've been collecting. Um, and I think the point from the colleague from Phuket is a really important one. Um, it's, it's, it's really critical because here we're talking about intervening within the city space that we look at the functional view of the city. So the hydrological systems uh, do not uh, correspond to the administrative boundaries of local governments in many of these, uh, in, I think all of these countries. Uh, so one of the things that we're doing, for example, is while we're intervening in Kuala Lumpur, there are many different municipalities upstream and downstream from the Klang River. Um, so the action plan and the data collection that, uh, that supports it will take that into account and be looking at engaging municipalities um, in the periphery as well as upstream and downstream um, along major waterways. Over. Thank you. Thank you for that, Omar. Um, probably can I entertain last two questions. Um, speaking of data collection, after the data collection phases, how can you ensure that the governments who have the authority for zoning, that is ensuring that no factories by the riverside, for example, plus the regulation of pollutants actually use the data to create better policies or enforcement? So uh, this is a very difficult question and a very, very important one. So anyone, any views? Okay, so I think maybe I can just uh, yeah. start. yes, Bernard, please. I think for many of the questions that uh, were posed uh, before, um, as well as um, for this one, I think it's important to ensure that right from the start, it is clear to all stakeholders, including the communities, what this entire process is for. But to engage in data collection or uh, any kind of discourse on. Uh, the marine plastic litter or waste collection is much more successful if right from the start it's clear that there is some kind of an action planning process that then also leads to um, implementation and the improvement of life. And um, for many communities, of course, uh, livelihoods and um, any sort of income generation is a primary concern and maybe much more important than, than a clean environment, which of course nobody uh, has anything against. Um, so I think that engagement to, to lay out some of the opportunities that can come with uh, such a process is important and, and not to enter um, this purely from, uh, from an academic uh, perspective or um, which of course is also important that most communities um, are very wary of this and then the participation is limited and obviously implementation um, is challenging. Thank you very much, Bernard. So I think it's more about uh, the city government doing the plans and the policies and getting all stakeholders involved in the process as well. So at this point, uh, uh, we will take note of the additional questions and I uh, will try to get back to those questions as well. But thank you very much for your active participation in the first round of the open forum. Thank you very much speakers. 
uh, Bernard, Omar, and Patrick. Let's move on to the next uh, few sessions. Uh, the fourth presentation out of six, Lightning Talk, will be delivered by our another, another important speaker. She is a fellow on Sustainable Cities and leads the ASEAN SDGs Front Northern Cities Program at the Institute for Global Environmental Strategies, or IGES. In parallel with research, she manages financial assistance, capacity building, and networking services for ASEAN governments. She has spent the last decade visiting over 50 frontrunner cities in Asia to learn how local leaders and citizens, innovators, and, in, and citizen innovators improve the quality of life in cities. To share with us how uh, to engage the community, private, and informal sectors in plastic recycling, the case study of Banjarmas in Indonesia, please welcome Ms. Shom Pio. Ms. Shom? Hello, everyone. Good afternoon. Today, I'm very glad to share with you the case of uh, one of our champion cities from the ASEAN SDGs Frontrunner Cities Network. It is uh, Banjarmasin, which is the capital of South Kalimantan region in Indonesia. It is south of Borneo. And the reason I chose this city is because um, the nickname is City of a Thousand Rivers. So this city used to be covered with a web of waterways linking to two major rivers. Um, and also this city has a quite some fame among Indonesian cities as being the first city to ban single use plastics in retail stores way back in 2016. Um, at that time, the national government was trying a policy of a plastic bag charge, but Banjar Masin City went ahead and beyond and banned single-use plastics. And now I want to share with you how they did it and why. Okay, next slide, please. Next slide, please. Okay, so just to give you an idea about this city, I think the beauty of this city, can you please go back to the first slide? The beauty of this city is that it manages to retain its um, traditional lifestyle of close relationship between the river and life, whereby you can find most of the citizens still working, living and playing in the rivers. And this gives the incentive for the government to really take care of the river and control plastics and waste pollution. Next slide, please. So, so it's common for many cities to, let's say, ban the plastic, but they don't really offer a clear alternative. In Banjar Masin, they have come up with a nature-based solution, which is also actually a tradition. This is a kind of a grass woven basket that is uh, sourced locally from the wetlands around Banjar Masin. It is um, very cheap, it is practical, and it can be stylish based on the levels of uh, artistic artistry of the locals. Next slide. And what is important also is the way the city officials communicate and get the cooperation from the com uh, community and stakeholders. This is uh, an example of how they engage the fresh market vendors and the residents staying around. So it's quite, um, although it is serious, it's also festive and it's also inclusive. Um, they use many soft elements like uh, singing and chanting of the city slogan. Next slide, please. You will see an example. So the people feel that the atmosphere is quite fun and engaging. And uh, the message is often brought, not in terms of ordering the people, but asking for their support because we are doing this not because we want to have better health and protect our local environment, but we also want to support the mayor's vision and target to put Banjar Masin City on the world map. So I think this is one of the defining success factor which uh, Banjar Masin stands apart from the typical efforts of in other cities. On the left and on the right, you can see these are the youths, which I believe are the key stakeholders for the environmental movement. So what is very interesting is that these youths are specially selected annually through a structured and competitive process by the mayor. So 
I think this is very interesting and maybe replicated in other cities. Next slide, please. That's a summary. Okay, um, I'd like to summarize the initiative in Banjar Masin. First of all, the city has clear and quantitative targets, and they also back those targets with actions. In this case, it is actually trying to replicate the community-based waste diversion centers called the waste banks in Indonesia. And um, they have already a long-term target to have 500 centers spread over five districts, and now they are halfway through. Not only that, this participation is institutionalized in the, let's say, schools. All schools must participate at these waste recovery centers. And this is utilizing the principle where the kids will change the behavior of parents. And also the city provides a regular budget to train the craft makers to upgrade their skills on how they can utilize the collected and recovered waste. Okay, and number two, so in order for all these efforts to be seriously taken, it's very important for the city to regulate it. And not only to regulate, but also provide a very acceptable and attractive alternative. With that, um, so it has been four years, and what the city claim is that the, the compliance rate for no plastic ban in retail stores have been close to 100% compliance rate. So now they have started to move forward and try to create plastic bag free fresh markets. And it is, is a very great challenge because there's lots of wet and messy produce at the fresh market. Um, we, I just have supported them to pilot these fresh markets and based on our early findings, with the combination of measures that they have done, it's possible to reduce the usage from 50 to 70% if the local community is very supportive and cooperative. And I think the key success factor is that it's not about telling people to stop doing something, but by using the alternative, which is locally produced and sourced, this provides really tangible benefits to the local people. Because new jobs are generated, the income is made, so people feel something like a positive cycle and not just um, inconvenience and disruption to their daily patterns. And number three, finally, of course, this is the foundation for all the successful front runner cities, which is a combination of the top down meets bottom up. And I think all cities face the same problem with manpower constraints. They don't have enough people to help mobilize the movement. But in the case of Banjarmasin City, you can see they really provide the budget and train the local volunteers as well as the youths to participate. So that's all for me today. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Somsan, for, for sharing the experience of Banjarmasin. And I think uh, we can highlight also the fact that there's an alternative if you ban something. Yes. So banning could work better if there's really an alternative that's being proposed and at the same time involving everybody households market vendors ed the education sector etc thank you shom see you later okay um for our case study number five uh our next speaker comes from a scientific and technical background with a strong focus on coastal and marine ecosystem his broad understanding of the issues faced by coastal and marine ecosystems has enabled him to be involved in multiple projects relating to conservation and environmental management, such as plastic pollution, port and ship carbon emissions, and youth environmental management. Currently, he works as the science and communication officer of the Partnerships in Environmental Management for the Seas of East Asia, or PEMC. He has an MRS in Ecological, Environmental, and Conservation Science from Imperial College London to present to us building partnerships, whole community waste reduction actions, the case study of Sham in China. Please welcome Mr. Thomas Bell. Thomas? Uh, good afternoon. Thank you, Voltaire, for that introduction. Uh, I am Thomas Bell. I'm from PEMSI. And the, the core of PEMSI is its partnerships. It's in the name. And the partnerships are what I want to focus on today. Uh, PEMSI and its partners focus on integrated coastal management, which takes a holistic viewpoint on developing coastal regions more sustainably, including through the management of solid waste. So on the next slide, there's a key network of 
the PEMSI network of local governments, which is focused on bringing together cities from around the East Asian region. They play a key role in marine debris management due to the nature of waste generation. So in 2019, the PNLG issued a joint declaration highlighting marine debris as a critical transboundary issue requiring action from PNLG members. One long-standing member of the PNLG, and the focus of this presentation is the city of Xiamen. PMC originally began as a pollution management project in Xiamen, so there's a long history of waste reduction efforts in the city. Can you go to the next slide, please? Xiamen has taken a holistic action to deal with waste and targets many points throughout the path of waste creation to waste being in the ocean. From the start, Xiamen convened expert panels and leadership groups to tackle marine debris prevention. And this was a local partnership that brought the city administration in touch with the uh, local experts and stakeholders and provided valuable feedback. The city invented in, invested in research and developed an integrated monitoring program for marine plastic debris. Together with the local universities, they've expanded this and they now also examine microplastics and monitor microplastic levels in water, organisms and sediments. To clean up the existing marine debris, they take action on the ocean as well as on the land. The sanitation agency is specifically tasked with the marine waste collection in the Zhulong River and the West Sea area. The infrastructure is put in place for this. They have uh, ships which they cover 62 square kilometers of water and collect 1900 tons of waste annually. On land, district management agencies are responsible for contracting sanitation teams to clean their beaches. Usually this is done twice a day after each high tide brings the waste in. The, in, the input from all this uh, activity allowed them to even model actions to be taken during extreme weather events, which are known to exacerbate waste issues. The Oceans and Fisheries Bureau provides a marine waste path forecast after storms, which can be used to predict the movement of waste. You can see that in the image there, one model. But in efforts to reduce the waste entering the ocean in the first place, the city, of course, implemented its rigorous segregation system, which they've developed more as time has gone on, coupled with a sustained public education campaign. Some pamphlets are produced targeting a variety of groups, even children. So they've created waste management comic books to distribute in schools to kindergarten and school classes participate in beach cleanups so that they directly see the effect that their waste can have on the environment. Lastly, the government of Xiamen has invested heavily in cooperation measures such as academic exchanges, international workshops and capacity building programs. The city has set up cooperative bodies with neighboring uh, areas to carry out more effective transboundary collective action because the, they have to deal with a lot of the waste coming from more inland areas along the rivers. Some of the laws and initiatives Yaman has started have been adopted nationally with its efforts being replicated elsewhere in China. PEMSI takes some key lessons from the partnerships in the Xiamen experience. We see that engaged leadership is needed to champion the initiatives within the city the importance of monitoring and measuring as part of your actions and activities, messaging to convey the program to the public and highlight the negative impacts of waste pollution and the positive benefits that can come from ensuring that uh, waste levels are reduced. Integrated planning, which is now part of a coastal use zoning policy, dedicated funding from local budgets and capacity building actions. And of course, a holistic approach throughout government with interrelated initiatives. So all these different actions are part of one cohesive approach rather than siloed effort. There's constant communication and partnership between the local bodies that have to administer these different activities. So as a final point, I would like to share how we at PEMSI are seeing these lessons used in new projects. So on the next slide, there's a summary of the ASEANO project, which covers some local regions in Southeast Asia. This project takes capacity building as a key outcome of the project to promote long-term sustainability 
changes in affected communities. It seeks to utilize pre-existing local bodies to develop better understanding of research and monitoring. And these are both actions and measures that are taken from examples such as Yaman. Finally, it is structured to include local, so within the city, regional, between the different cities, and international partnerships, often in terms of academic sharing. And it draws on this cooperation to enhance and sustain its impact. So these partnerships are really key. I do hope that this Key of Solutions conference is another important moment towards strengthening partnerships at various levels to tackle the marine pollution challenges we face. So thank you very much for listening to this lightning presentation. Thank you very much, uh, Thomas, for sharing. We definitely need a lot of regional capacity building measures to help cities in uh, reducing marine litter. Uh, also at the same time, we also think that your presentation already highlighted the fact that it's really should really be a holistic mo model, not just in actions, but at the same time in looking at the different plans cohesively to address marine litter. So thank you, Thomas, and I'll see you in uh, after five minutes before we make the you. last presentation. Thank you, Thomas. Okay, so coming on to the last, but a very important presentation about baselining. We have to understand first then the problem. Our next speaker is the Chief Environment Officer of Nairobi Metropolitan Services. She was a Bachelor of Science degree in Environmental Health, Master of Science degree in Health Systems Management, and Diploma in Water, Cert, Water Sector Governance and Operation, the Danish model. Recently, she was awarded um, the top of seal approval after submitting a proposal to fund the project enhancing Nairobi's community-based organization's capacity in solid waste management. She is a member of the multi-agency team that spearheaded Nairobi's solid waste management transition from a linear to a circular economy model. Uh, but she spearheaded participation in solid waste management unit in the Connective Cities platform and is among JICA's teams that formulated and implemented the integrated solid waste management strategy for Nairobi City. To discuss with us the application of the Waste Wise Cities plastic leakage assessment tool in Nairobi, Kenya, please welcome Ms. Patricia Akini Gumudho. Patricia, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Waltz. And um, it's uh, great to be here with all of you. So um, Nairobi uh, Metropolitan Services is a national agency that uh, is mandated in the office of the president to uh, execute key sectors uh, in Nairobi city county government and uh, solid waste management is one of them. And uh, the Republic of Kenya has 47 counties. Nairobi is one of them. And Nairobi couples as the capital city uh, of Kenya. And it's a hub of activities ranging from industrial to residential, corporate, uh, not only in the city, in the, in the country, but also in the region. So that means we generate uh, a lot of waste. We generate about 3,000 3, tons of waste daily. And that comes from the activities within the city. And um, we find there's quite a huge population that works in the city, but resides in the neighboring counties. So that cross um, activity and movement uh, uh, contributes to that amount of waste. Now, last year, 2019, uh, led by UN Habitat, conducted uh, the monitoring of SDG 1161. So this was a brief study of about uh, one to two months. But this study was updating some data sets that we had from a comprehensive study that we did with uh, JICA. Uh, that was in 2010. And uh, of course, now that was almost 10 years of, of uh, a gap in update of the data. However, there were some projections that were recommended with the, with the JICA on how we can come up with uh, up-to-date data. But now the study of the survey that we did last year with UN Habitat gave us some uh, reflection of how it is currently. So this informed a paradigm shift on how we manage the solid waste in the sea from the linear to the circular economy model. And we also came up with uh, some data sets and we noted that 
we generate about 456 tons of plastic waste daily. And uh, generally, we have a collection rate of 74% of the general waste. That means about 26% of the waste is left uncollected. When it's left uncollected, it goes into the open landfills, it goes into the waterways, into the rivers, into the drains, and of course, it ends up into the ocean. But for plastic waste, the collection rate is 91%. And from what is collected, only a small percentage, about 3%, is recovered formally. By formal recovery, I mean the actors in resource recovery who are uh, authorized, who have the legal licenses to operate. And mostly you'll find these are the manufacturing industries and those who have formal uh, facilities. Then we have uh, the informal actors who are about 28%. Informal, I mean individual waste pickers from the point of waste generation. Some of them even ride in the waste collection trucks, trying to recover waste. And then we have some brokers in the informal settlements where sometimes we have formal uh, organized groups like community-based organizations who recover plastics. And then we have these brokers who take them now to the manufacturing industries. And then we have about 4,000 uh, waste pickers at our final disposal site who recover waste. Of course, plastic is, is, is one of them. So uh, we can see about 60% of plastic waste is not recovered. So that ends up in the final disposal site. And uh, yeah, so we, we from then in the next slide, we are going to see um, how the survey gave us a snapshot of how the flow of waste is in the circular economy model. We were able to identify the key challenges, the, the solutions, and the main points what are improving the waste collection so that we can have 100% collection and re eliminate the plastic leakage. Then we have streamlining the resource recovery so that we can improve the material recovery and have more formal actors and finally it was to improve the final disposal you can see there's rampant uh, burning of waste there's that plastic waste that is buried for years so that's a snapshot of the model that we have uh, highlighting the challenges and the possible solutions thank you so much for your time uh, that's how it is in Nairobi Thank you very much, Patricia. Your presentation highlighted the fact that we can only manage what we can measure. And uh, Nairobi's experience is really comprehensive in uh, doing the SDG 11.6.1. And of course, marine litter reduction um, strategizing based on the baseline. Thank you, Patricia. So at this yeah. point, we'd like to invite again, Patricia, Shom, and Thomas to join us for the open forum Q&A part two. Okay, so I think we, uh, we just have a comment that the EU-German project on rethinking plastics will also support Banjarma, seen in Hanoi, Vietnam in uh, plastic bag reduction. But there was a question about uh, legal instruments. I think it was initially addressed to uh, Shom, but uh, I think Thomas and, uh, and uh, Patricia could also chime in when it comes to the legal instruments. The question is, is there a legal instrument for institutions to participate in the initiative? Uh, at the fresh market or probably other initiatives um, that are implemented in the different cities? Shom? Hello. Hi. Hello. Okay. Yeah. Um, the question seems very straightforward. Is there regulations? In the case of Banjarmasin, there is so there is a city level regulations which is um, can be issued under the powers of the mayor. So yes. So there is a legal backing to the initiative. Yes, yes. How about uh, Patricia and, and the Thomas? officials? I think when the officials go and request the compliance, they need to say, okay, the mayor has uh, already adopted this and now we need you to uh, cooperate with us if we if you don't have this it's all i think it's voluntary and it cannot scale it cannot scale yes and it cannot be enforced yes <laughs> it cannot be enforced yes <laughs> okay so how about you patricia 
probably not in the application of the market uh, uh, in the wet markets, but uh, in, in the baselining, for example, or in the implementation of the different initiatives? Um, yes, uh, we have legal instruments. Of course, uh, we need to improve on them, but they are stronger legal instruments are at national level. So even in regards to this uh, circular economy model, um, uh, the existing uh, regulations and acts uh, at national level support it, but currently uh, the legal instrument at national level, the act and the policy, the strategy are at the final stages of the National Assembly. At county level, as you're aware, Nairobi, Kenya just uh, implemented the devolved governance system 10 years ago. So counties are picking up onto such uh, improving their legal framework. But for Nairobi, we were from 2015, we already had a solid waste management act, which was good enough as a starting platform. And um, yes, uh, there is room for improvement. And uh, we are, uh, and the circular economy model is new uh, as from last year. Uh, nevertheless, even the national government is coming up with a extended producer responsibility, which is also at its final uh, stages, the guidelines and, and the legal framework to back the implementation of such initiatives. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, it's uh, about uh, the realization and the actualization of circular economy because for some cities, it's really abstract for them. But if there's really a legal mandate, exactly what's covered in that, that would uh, enhance the implementation of- uh, I would just like to add that in, in, in addition to the legal framework, at least in, in the case I was looking at, in other cases, PEMT has worked at, there's, it's important that the administrative framework is built on top of that and it can go a bit further. So that's how um, in, in Xiamen, they have the, uh, not just the legal basis, but they have the, the advisory expert panels to organize and they have the cooperative bodies that they set up with neighboring uh, jurisdictions. So it's, there's a, a strong uh, ability to build administrative structures, even where the legal structure may not meet everything that is required. So thank you also for highlighting that there's a national framework, there's a city level framework, and there's also an intermunicipal cooperation framework that can be worked. So thank you very much speakers for your contribution. So I'll just be making a bit of a synthesis and wrap up to the discussions. Um, waste management was initially considered as a local problem, but when Marine Later study suggested that the width and longevity of its impacts, it was viewed indeed as a global problem. This session now emphasized how actions could be localized and multiplied to collectively make a global impact. So this session four brought stakeholders together to share experiences and challenges and solutions to close the loop and identify opportunities for collaboration. It shed light on the many initiatives and innovations that can be carried out at the city and municipal levels to reduce waste generation and waste leakage. So in the end, it's just a choice of having the will to do something as exemplified by our inspiring panel discussions or just deliberately do nothing. And based on today's discussion, I don't think it's the latter. So thank you very much again, once again, speakers and participants for joining this session number four and uh, uh, enjoy the rest of the presentations for the Sea of Solutions. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much for your expert moderation of the parallel session four, Voltaire. Um, and thank you all for attending Sea of Solutions this year, as well as today's session. Um, there are side events that are continuing to happen as we speak, so please go ahead and go to the link that I'm now pasting in the chat to join uh, those side events. Um, thank you very much for being with us today. Uh, please feel free to check out the exhibitors and network with other attendees in the Hublo platform. I will go ahead and end the meeting now. Take care and have a great rest of your day. Okay.